Revelation chapter 9. I was going to do something this, uh, this weekend. I, I thought about doing it and I haven't done it yet. I was going to go back and look and see when we started this uh, Sunday school lesson on the book of Revelation. I think some of us were wearing bell bottoms at that time. Huh? Yeah, 10 years later. Uh, let's see here. We did that, we did that, we did that, we did that. Let's see, we did that. We had the bottomless pit. Um, talking about the bottomless pit. Let's see, yeah. In Revelation. Let's, let's read the, uh, let's read this here, Revelation 9, 11, and 12. Um, let, let me just kind of ask you uh, what your opinion is. Um, I, I think that the king in verse 11 uh, that's over the, the locusts, uh, I believe the king that's over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, I believe that is the Antichrist. Um, let me just kind of hear from you what you think. If, that, if you think it is, or you think it's a different, really bad, evil angel. Gary, you got any thoughts on that? No, not right now. Huh? Okay. We'll try to help you out best as we can. Anybody else got any thoughts on it? What do you think, Derek? Huh? Okay. So you think it could be. All right. Anybody else? All right. We'll, we'll go with a presumption, okay, and try not to be presumptuous, because that's one of the marks of a false teacher. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. All right, so Revelation 9, 11, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe was passed, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So we, we have a total of three woes that are going to be presented to the world. And uh, last Sunday, we just, let me run through these very quickly, uh, the verses that speak of the bottomless pit, Revelation eleven seven, 7, uh, deals with the two witnesses. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And then when you compare that to Revelation 13, and in what we did was, we, I remember now, we compared it with uh, later on down in Revelation 13, where this particular beast in Revelation 13, 1, uh, that he saw rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, um, also made, shall make war against, it's the same phrase, the saints, and, and shall overcome them. And, the, and when you look in Revelation, uh, let's see, what verse was that? 13 something, uh, 13, yeah, 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Same phrase, same phrase he uses in Revelation 11, 7 and Revelation 13, 7. He's, power is given to him. And I want you to think about that word. Let's see here. Am I, am I adding that word to the scripture? No. I've got a message this morning that um, I think God's leading me to preach. And my mind's on it right now. So maybe I'm like Gary. I can't think right. Um, Okay, I, I am right. The, in verse 2 of Revelation 13, the dragon gave him his power, his seed, and great authority. So I think, I think they match. I think both of them are dealing with the same thing. Uh, in Revelation 17, 
Uh, if you'd turn there in verse 7, the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. Uh, we'll be talking about that um, this afternoon. The mystery of the woman uh, whose name is Mystery. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. There he is again. He's a, this is describing the beast of Revelation 13. And I believe Revelation 9 verse 11. The beast shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Uh, the star that fell had the key to open that pit up to let him and those locusts out. And then he goes into perdition. Perdition is destruction. Um, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, now watch this. This is the marvel and the beauty and um, the supremacy of the King James. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, I don't understand something that isn't, but it is. I don't understand that. I don't understand how a light switch could be on and off at the same time. I don't understand that. And you might be saying, well, dummy, you don't understand it because it's not possible. That's not true. Now that we know more about what they call quantum physics, um, we know when, when I was in grade school, we were taught that the smallest thing that makes up everything in the world is the atom. You remember hearing that in school. Atoms make up everything. You have hydrogen atoms and iron atoms and carbon atoms, and they, and they make up everything that is. They're the smallest thing there is. But what we weren't told was that they were already working on theories even when some of you were in school not trying to say you're really old, but they were working on theories of things smaller than atoms. What is it that makes a proton, a neutron, an electron? Something smaller than the atom is what makes the atom. And here's what all of the quantum physicists agree on, is that in the quantum realm, when you get down that small, the rules of this physical world don't apply because and they know it they know it for a fact they've tested it that a quantum particle can be in two places at the exact same time I don't understand that but they've tested it and they know it's true they also know that let's say that let's say you got a quantum particle over here uh, on Mars, and it's, it looks like a, a die, like a, a, a dice, and it's showing the number six over here on Mars. And then you've, over here in Missouri, where we are, is another set of the dice. It's also on six. We know that if we change this dice to four, this dice on Mars will change to four. That's called quantum entanglement. That no matter how far apart they're spread, they could be on both ends of the universe, but when you change one, you'll, the other one will change two. We know that. We also know that it's possible for quantum particles to travel in time. Now, they only made it travel like point zero 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 seven milliseconds or something like that but that's still time travel we know this okay so I want you to look again at that phrase on the last part of that verse the world is gonna wonder and no wonder they're going to wonder 
Because they have a beast who is not, yet is. And I, I, I'm not going to take the time to show you uh, symbols and things like that that I believe teach that. But one of the symbols that I can think of offhand is the symbol called the yin yang. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? It's a circle and it has a black part in it and a white part in it. And in the white part, it has a black dot. And in the black part, it has a white dot. And it's an Eastern, Asian, whatever. It's an Eastern mystic symbol that describes what they believe is the, the forces that govern the universe. And it, it literally means the white area, let's say the white area represents light. So what, with a black dot in it, they're saying that this light can be darkness at the same time. And this area that's dark, it has a white dot in it. It can be both light and dark at the same time. When it pertains to their idea or their concept of God, is the Bible tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, how many of you understand that? That's easy, right? How much darkness is there in God? Zero. And yet, the yin-yang symbol says that God is represented by the white part, and yet there is a little bit of evil in God. And let's say the black part represents the devil, and, it, and that would say there's a little bit of good in the devil. Who believes that? I don't. Okay? But that's their God. They believe that there's a little good in all evil and a little evil in all good. So what we're doing is we're mixing opposites, aren't we? We're mixing. We're, uh, the first thing that God did when he created the universe, he said, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Light is not dark and dark is it? Say no. Or is it? Turn to Job 10. Shake your head at me. Job chapter 10. There is a place that your Bible tells you that light and darkness are the same. I will give you a hint. It's a place you don't want to go to. Job chapter 10. Look at verse 21. Actually, let's get the gist. Verse 20. Are not my days few? Cease then and let me alone that I may take, a, take comfort a little. Before I go whence I shall not return even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. Now, remember Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So verse 22 says, it's a land of darkness as darkness itself and the shadow of death without any order where the light, what does that say? Is as darkness. A quantum realm where something can exist in opposite states at the same time. Okay. And it says, notice that in verse 22, it says it's the land of the shadow of death and it's without any order. To have order would mean that if the light switch is on, the lights are on. That's order, right? How did, how did Paul instruct the church at Corinth to conduct their church services? Let all things be done, how? And in order. And especially when it came to the speaking of tongues. Let one, then another, and maybe a third, and that by course. In other words, this one first, that one, and then that one. But not all at once. And then let one interpret in order. But what you, when you go into these churches and hear this chaos everywhere, is that of the Holy Spirit? 
It can't be because it violates Scripture. Scripture cannot be broken. So in God's realm, if the light switch, if the faucet is on, you got water coming out. If the faucet is off, water doesn't come out. But in this realm, of course, there's no water in this area. Even light is the same as darkness. Because there's no order. And that's where this beast comes from. Okay? And the world is going to wonder after him because I'm, there has never been anybody like him before and never will be anybody like him afterward. He is going to be the most unique thing or individual that man has ever seen. And I, I have been saying this along this line here in the last several months to me it makes sense then when we see the push of the transgendered movement everybody pushing towards gender f fluidity in other words somebody can believe that they are both male and female at the same time okay but is that true no you either have a Y chromosome or you have an X chromosome, and that determines the gender. Okay? Yes, Gary. Okay. I never, I never noticed that, but it, it could be, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think I get what you mean there, because that's where the pit is. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and that and that yin yang symbol basically would be a good symbol to represent the transgendered movement. Here's a male who is presenting himself as a female. He has let his hair grow, or he's wearing a wig. He is wearing women's clothing. He's wearing makeup. He might, he might have himself altered surgically or and, and or altered uh, with hormones. But he is a, he is, his chromosomes, his DNA still says he is a male. But it's like you pointed out. The Native Americans called him what, George? Two-spirited. Two opposite of each other existing in the same place at the same time two spirits okay so here's another question can two objects be in the same place at the exact same time on my desk it can trust me okay it is a monster can two objects be in the same place at the exact same time? No, but can a, is the world trying to convince us that a person can be both a male and a female in the same body at the same time? The answer is no, but that spirit of opposites fusing together is what this beast represents. Remember... Uh, in Daniel 2, Sterling, where the toes of the image have iron and clay. And I've asked you before, can you, can you weld iron to clay? You can't do it. They won't stick together because one of them, the Bible even says the, the iron is hard. And clay is soft, soft as clay. The Bible's telling you they're opposites. And yet they try to fuse them together to be the basis of what causes that image to stand. But the truth of it is, it can't stand, can it? Because clay and iron don't mix together. It doesn't work. Okay? So anyway, I'll move off that. Uh, no, I won't. There's Job 10 there. <laughs> I'll move on. Uh, Revelation 20. Watch this. This part I like. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. I like it already. And he laid hold on the dragon, 
That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Now, so there's no misunderstanding here. Who he's got? He's got the dragon. He's got the old serpent. He's got the devil and Satan. And they're all the same guy. And bound him a thousand years. How long is a thousand years? A millennium. How long is a millennium? A thousand years. So, um, believe it or not, when I went to the Bible college out in Oklahoma, the majority of free will Baptists in Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, and overall in that area were amillennial, which means that they had this belief that the book of Revelation was merely symbolic. It wasn't literal. And that Satan was now bound already and Christ was reigning now over the world, which is not true. Okay? And that Satan was bound and so on and so forth. And they, when they, when you say, well, it says here a thousand years, they will say, they'll come up with this, um, scholarly stuff like, well, what you don't understand is that back then, 2,000 years ago, the number 1,000 was just seen as an enormous number because nobody knew really what 1,000 was. And so they, um, they just used that as a symbol to say that it's going to last for a long, long time. That's the kind of stuff you hear in Bible college. But if Jesus said that he was going to rise again on the third day, what day did he rise from on the third day? So if the Bible says David picked up five smooth stones, how many stones did he pick up? If Naaman was told to dip in the River Jordan seven times, he's got to dip seven times. If the priest is told to sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant seven times, can he do six? Can he do five? Can he do eight? No, he's got to do it the way God said to do it. The numbers mean what numbers mean. And a thousand means a thousand. God said it and it means it. So Christ literally is going to come down from heaven. Satan is going to be bound uh, in the bottomless pit. Can you imagine falling for a thousand years? How many of you have the, 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 the fall dream almost as soon as you go to sleep? Yeah, I hate that. Okay. Uh, and that only lasts like a second, right? How would you like to have that feeling for a thousand years? So he's falling a thousand years. Christ is going to reign. Uh, verse 3, cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season. So in other words, truth is going to reign for a thousand years. Won't that be refreshing? Amen. But then verse 7, then when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his, notice now the word is prison. The bottomless pit is a prison. Okay? So are there spirits in there right now? Are there spirits in prison right now? Yeah, P Peter said so. And Christ went to preach to spirits in prison. Shut up in prison. Okay? So, uh, and think, think about this. Do a study of the word prison in the Bible. Just the word prison. Where did Joseph have to go when he was accused of sleeping with Potiphar's wife? Prison. And who is Joseph a type of? He's a type of Christ. And Christ is preaching to spirits in prison. And what did Joseph do while he was in prison? He's prophesying to the baker and the butler. Isn't it neat? When they brought Jesus and stood him up before the, the children of Israel, who did they get to also stand before Israel so Israel could choose to let one of them go? Barabbas. And where was Barabbas at when they went and got him? He was in prison. Guess who Barabbas was? the antichrist and you notice that the majority of the jews chose the wrong one they chose the wrong one many people 
are going to wake up one day realizing they've chosen the wrong guy. Okay? And anyway, verse 8, And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Uh, I had that in my notes. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. Luke 23, And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man and release unto us Barabbas, who for certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. There it is. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So that's what Christ did during those days where his body laid in the tomb, but his body did not rot, it did not corrupt, no rigor mortis, no smell, no, no rotting flesh, nothing. Uh, it was as if he was just laying there asleep, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. And so we have spirits that have been tossed into prison. My guess is, and I, I, I think I have the scripture to bear this out, that these spirits that are in prison are the ones that left their first estate and they took wives of which they chose genesis 6 in the book of job the bible says that god charged his angels with folly in other words he charged them with a crime and that is mating with these human women and producing this hybrid race called the giants and for that, God sentenced them or put them in and held them and is holding them in prison right now. One of these days, they're going to be released. But when you get out of prison, if, if, you, get, if you get arrested and get put into county jail, what usually happens after that? You have a trial. If you're found guilty, where do you go? Go to the big house, go to Bon Terre, okay, or somewhere else, but you go to prison after that. You, so think of hell in the bottomless pit as the county jail, holding everybody, everybody that you know that has died, lost in sin is being held right now in the county jail. And the great white throne judgment, you're going to have the resurrection of the damned. And all of those people will be resurrected, brought out of the county jail, the bottomless pit and hell, and brought up to appear before God, the righteous judge, who will judge them according to their works. And then they will be cast into the lake of fire, which burns for how long? Forever and ever and ever and ever. Jesus gave us a picture of that when he talked about the shepherd dividing the sheep from the goats. And in case there's some misunderstanding in your mind that maybe, maybe these people get burned up and then cease to exist anymore, in Matthew 25, when Jesus is giving that parable of the sheep and the goats, he said the goats go into everlasting punishment. Not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? No, huh? No. Um, there's a theological word I'm trying to remember, probably. But anyway, it's like they just dissolve, they burn up and dissolve away. Okay? But think of it like this. When we get our new bodies, will it ever perish? No. It will be in an everlasting state of life. There'll be no corruption in it, no pain, nothing. So then when God resurrects those wicked people, gives them a new body, that body is meant to burn forever. And those people, and I, to, to just talk about hell bothers me. Because when you think of the reality of hell and think of what could have happened had God not brought you 
into his glorious kingdom. How that you would be burning in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm glad Christ died for me. I am so glad that my Father in heaven... That's why I told you to think of those words. Amen? I'm glad that Jesus loves me. Uh, no, somebody sent me a message and they thought I was thinking of maybe soul sleep. Um, I, can't think, I can't think of the word, but it's the idea that when people are cast into hell or the lake of fire that they eventually just burn up uh, and I can't I can't think of the word right now but I appreciate the help Vern um, so anyway uh, that's what Jesus was doing he was preaching to those spirits that left their first estate that uh, created the giants and so on and one of these days they're going to be brought out they're going to be judged cast into the lake of fire forever and ever uh, because Jesus said that it was prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, that's who it was originally prepared for. Um, turn to Exodus 12. I'm trying to remember why I... Oh, 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 oh. Exodus 12. Turn to Exodus 12. We noted that the... Um, the name of this king is Abaddon in Hebrew. And you can get a Strong's Concordance and look that up. Or you can go to Blue Letter Bible and uh, find the, the, the Hebrew word there. And it'll tell you that it means destroyer. So you have Abaddon in Hebrew, means destroyer. You have Apollo or Apollyon, and they are both the, of the same root, derivation. They both derive from the, the word that means to destroy. So the destroyer is coming. The destroyer right now is being held in this pit. One of these days, God is going to release that destroyer. And again, once again, in God's beautiful Bible, he draws us a picture of what that's going to look like. Because we have the destroyer here as, one of, as the tenth plague. So Exodus 12, verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts. So the two side beams of the door and the, the header, the lintel over the top of the door. Put blood on those three places right there. For the... Um, that is in the bay, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. I think that's important. I think God would tell you, stay inside. Amen? Stay inside. So what would happen if you, being a Jew, decided you wanted to step outside for a smoke, they think it's okay if you stepped outside and it wasn't morning, you're going to be killed. You're going to die. So the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts. The Lord, and this is where the word comes from, will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer. That's, what, that's his name. To come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee, to thy sons forever. Let me ask you, uh, it may sound like a silly question, but I, in today's world, I don't think it is anymore. 
Uh, and some of you already know what, what I believe on this. Do you believe that devils live in houses? You believe they can enter into people's houses? Even if the door's locked? Uh, I remember last night, before I went to sleep, for some reason, maybe God laid it on my heart or whatever, but I've prayed this before, God, put angels around my house tonight. Guard and protect us, because we'll be asleep. And I know that these things can come in. So for some reason, last night, God laid it on my heart to pray God put angels around my house and protect us and keep us safe. I don't think there's anything wrong with praying that. In fact, I think it's probably wise to do it often. Now, I believe sometimes God will protect, in fact, not sometimes, all the time, God protects us um, e even if we don't ask, okay? We don't have to ask for God to protect us every time we think we need protection every second. God will always be there. But I think it's a good idea because he clearly says here, he will not suffer, which means allow the destroyer to come in under your houses to smite you. But clearly the destroyer went in to the houses where there was no blood on the door, on the doorpost and the lintel and killed the firstborn of every family in that house. Okay? Devils in the house. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I agree. I am someone, I, I fear things, okay, quite a bit. And uh, it's all part of learning how to deal with it. And how to deal with it is to pray and get your Bible out and read some Psalms or read it, whatever, whatever God sends you to make you happy. And you'll start trusting the Lord again that God, you, you, you'll, be like, you'll be like Gehazi who Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes and let him see because Elisha told him, Gehazi, there's more with us than there are with them. And he's like, no, there isn't. I can count. Clearly, we don't have enough people. Lord opened his eyes and he saw chariots of fire and horses of fire all around. And he's like, whoa. Whew. And then God, boy, I mean, no, I won't get into that, but whew, I like that story. Amen. One of these days. Thank you. Thank you for that. One of these days, I think God's going to open up everybody's eyes and they're going to see that God's got his angels around us. Amen. I believe that. In Job chapter 15, the wicked man travaileth with pain all his days and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. A dreadful sound is in his ears. In prosperity, the destroyer shall come upon him. Uh... I think of people like, um, uh, oh, now, now I can't remember his name. I say I think of him and I can't think of who it is. Jeffrey Epstein. Wealthy man, wicked man. Very wicked man. And thought that because of the people that he bought out and the Go ahead. And the people that he bought out and the people that he had on his airplane list going to that island, he thought that was going to protect him. God said no. They tossed him in jail and he was in there. I'll give you a number. You want, you want to hear something interesting? 33 days after they officially charged him with crimes, he was dead, George. 33 days exactly. Not after he went in jail, but 33 days after they charged him, he was found hanging in his cell. And that is, in prosperity, the destroyer shall come upon him. Amen? Uh, even rich people die. Amen. All right, let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. 
Lord, open up our eyes and our hearts to wondrous, mighty things, Lord, that are in it. Father, just bless, um, bless us this morning as we go into service. Lord, open up our hearts and our eyes and our ears. Help us to hear wondrous things. Help us, dear God, to hear things that will help us. Maybe make it through the day. Help us to get through the week. Help us later on in life, Lord, to build on things that we already know. Remind us of things, Father, that we once learned. But we ask you to bless this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen.